thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Billy, for an introduction to the overall system. Thank you, Shiliang, for laying out the plans to date. I think that's a great basis to jump into what I think are um, an important and somewhat unexplored set of design issues in the Chinese emissions trading system, specifically center on how the system will interact with features of the Chinese economy. So we can think about the title of this paper is Institutions and Emissions Trading in China. And we can think about institutions in this context as a set of formal rules and informal norms that govern the way businesses um, and individuals are interacting in an economy. So it's sort of a Northian definition. And um, I'm going to get more specific about this, but I want to start by pointing out that initially it's important to think about um, what institutions pre-exist uh, in an economy when you're thinking about the design of energy and environmental policy and how will those policies um, interact with, uh, with those um, institutions. Uh, there's been a lot of work, of course, done in this area and thinking about transaction costs and how those can reduce cost effectiveness of uh, market-based uh, policy instruments um, for environmental control. And then uh, also work done, and as an example, Meredith Dolly's work thinking about how uh, emissions trading, uh, in this case, um, uh, for local air pollutions, pollu pollutants, um, uh, interact with uh, pre-existing economic regulation um, in the electric power sector and show that that can also affect abatement decisions as well. So there are a number of examples of ways that uh, market-based and other environmental policy instruments can interact with um, institutions in an economy. Now when we go to China, there are several distinct features of, of China's economy that I think um, I'm going to uh, uh, present some arguments uh, around why we should think about these a little bit more carefully. So um, there's, uh, despite decades of economic reform, still quite a significant degree of uh, residual state control of industry, and I'll talk about what that means. Uh, there's managed pricing. I think um, there's been some nice work by uh, uh, Tung Fei and, and Frank Jotso on this uh, issue and how that would interact with the emissions trading system in China. And then, um, there's also uh, quite a lot of work um, done to, uh, that shows despite economic reforms in many energy intensive uh, sectors, uh, industrial sectors, there's a continued reliance on plan-based allocation me uh, mechanisms. Uh, markets often work with, with benchmarks um, uh, of the type that Billy described and uh, that to some extent limits the actual uh, opportunity for a market to provide a cost-reducing um, uh, uh, force. So uh, I should also say that I'll talk a little bit about how state control uh, has implications um, for uh, uh, the interaction with other environmental and production targets. Uh, this is not, I will not claim that this is specific to China, this of course exists in other other parts of the world as well. So um, big picture, we want to think broadly about how the institutions of China's economy will interact with the trading system, and my focus in this presentation will be on the role of state control. So the first thing, uh, first sort of stylized fact I want to uh, present is that even though state ownership has declined substantially across a number of sectors in China, what we state control has not. In fact, state control has, has stayed um, at least um, uh, sort of constant, if not in recent years, increased slightly in some of the sectors that are important uh, for the emissions trading system. And what this graph shows is uh, on the left-hand side, so state control um, through either uh, minority or majority shareholding. So um, uh, usually an enterprise will have a designated controlling shareholder. If that, that entity is the state, then that firm, even if minor, if it as a minority share of state ownership could still be considered a state controlled firm subject to many of the uh, issues that I'll describe. Now, uh, by other measures such as having state ownership share above 50%, state ownership, ownership has decreased substantially. So uh, you can see that from the graph on the right hand side. Now it's worth noting that these shares, starting shares in 2003 are actually still uh, there are 
uh, follow many, many decades of reform that, that reduced the amount of state ownership in China from almost complete state ownership in 1980 um, to much uh, smaller shares of overall state ownership that we see today. Now the other important, I think, stylized fact here is that uh, sectors differ in terms of the degree of state control. So uh, this shows the time trend in the share of state uh, control. Again, we're focusing on control here. Uh, in the electric power sector, which has remained much uh, higher than in other sectors, such as non-metallic minerals. Cement, which is one of the first industries expected to be included in the emissions trading system, belongs to the non-metallic minerals uh, sector category. Um, and it has basically tracked the share of state enterprises uh, nationwide, the average overall trend since, uh, since at least 2000, shown here. Now, the other important point about um, state control is that it can be mapped to different layers of China's governing hierarchy. To illustrate this, uh, what I've shown you here is uh, on the left-hand side, the uh, graphic is basically showing you the structure of China's government, which has uh, five different uh, nested levels, from the central level to the provincial or provincial level municipality level, prefectural city level, within prefectural cities you have counties, and within counties you have townships. And so at each of these different levels you could also have state controlled enterprises. So you could think about um, on the right hand side, those ownership categories can all coexist within a single location, but they have very distinct uh, levels of oversight. And if we think about environmental policy as originating from the central government uh, with the administrative support of the provincial government, which are directly evaluated by the central government, um, we can think about maybe central state-owned enterprises and provincial state-owned enterprises as having significant uh, pressure to uh, clean up when environmental policies are prioritized. Now, I'm going to just briefly summarize some of the other attributes of state-controlled firms that could, could matter here. I mentioned we're talking about having state as a controlling shareholder, um, oversight at various levels of government. Um, these firms are often expected to provide local employment opportunities and other sort of social responsibility um, functions. There's wide variation across sectors, and um, this brings me to, uh, and I should say, um, this brings me to three uh, specific attributes of state-owned enterprises that I'm going to look at in this presentation. The first is the fact that these enterprises, uh, at least historically, have been able to access uh, capital at lower interest rates uh, relative to private firms in many of these areas. So we can think about these firms as having a capital subsidy. To, uh, we can also think about these firms as having uh, a higher degree of uh, accountability as well as uh, sort of social responsibility goals um, that they face and that they must fulfill as part of their um, contracts with uh, local governments. And then um, the channels of enforcement are also different for state-owned enterprises. Uh, the accountability channels run through personnel, promotion, career concerns types of, of channels as, as much as they do through um, fines, um, and other financial forms of penalties. And so I'm going to focus in the rest of my presentation on what these particular three attributes of China's remaining state-controlled enterprises might mean for the operation of the emissions trading system. So first I want to give you a little bit of evidence that um, these you know, stylized facts and um, evidence is, is in fact true if you look at firm level data so what I'm showing you here is a randomly selected sample of China's annual economic survey balanced across industries um, in order to show you that uh, for different ownership types you see very different uh, capital and labor prices. Specifically central state owned enterprises have significantly lower um, imputed capital prices um, by about a third and then labor prices tend to be much higher for central state owned enterprises. Lower for local state enterprises in part because um, some of these have been um, even uh, uh, have been uh, partially privatized or undergone additional uh, um, reforms uh, relative to central state-owned enterprises, which during a program of what's called grasping the large, letting go of the small, where 
they're a government, central government authority over a set of uh, large state-owned enterprises that's essentially consolidated. And those firms are still um, uh, not only state-controlled, but often state-owned, and often come with particular privileges for their employees that are reflected in this um, labor price, which includes both financial and non-financial compensation. So this is just to show you that, in fact, um, in, in these data, uh, you, can, you can see how these, uh, the, both the relative magnitudes as well as the uh, sort of general directions play out. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, how capital subsidies might interact with an emissions trading system. So we're going to sort of imagine uh, a, a sector with two types of firms, state controlled firms and private firms. Um, each firm uh, has unconstrained emissions, and again, I'm going to do this for a mass-based uh, program first, and I'll talk briefly about what a rate-based program would involve, um, or what it would imply uh, for, uh, for uh, the state, non-state um, uh, heterogeneity. So we can think about you know, firms trade permits, um, where they choose a level of reductions, uh, based on the prevailing permit price, which we assume here is exogenous, and uh, so um, unconstrained emissions are um, either reduced by abatement at the facility, or um, uh, or uh, the firm must purchase the remaining uh, its uh, permits to cover its remaining obligations. Firms are then uh, choosing to minimize costs, subject to the emissions price. For a state-owned firm, we're adding um, a, a term s. Um, is a function of reductions taken, which is essentially a subsidy to abatement. Here we assume that uh, abatement costs um, are made up entirely of, of capital outlays. Uh, you could imagine extending this to a case where you, an abatement technology used both labor and capital. Um, and then we, uh, solving the first order conditions, we see that uh, for state-owned firms, uh, state-owned firms are actually going to um, abate up to the point where the marginal cost equals the prevailing permit price inclusive of, of the subsidy, which essentially functions as a subsidy to abatement. Okay? So what we're seeing is that state firms are undertaking more abatement than they would in the absence of the subsidy, whereas private firms would abate up to the marginal cost um, equivalent to the prevailing permit price. Now, um, is this a problem? I think what we can say uh, is that uh, this uh, capital subsidy will distort the uh, distribution of um, the impacts of the system, but it will not necessarily have an impact on total reductions achieved. So, but basically what you're saying is that it's kind of, um, uh, the intuition here is that uh, capital subsidies um, are changing the distribution of abatement that's undertaken. You're actually basically over abating if you're a state-owned firm and you're um, relative to what you would have otherwise done. Um, and so, uh, essentially, um, this has, this of course, uh, still firms fulfill all of their obligations, it's just shifting some of the abatement burden um, onto the state-owned firms. Now, if we think about an output index cap, um, there's some interesting interactions, and this is um, in a technical appendix to the paper. Um, and I'm um, going to elaborate this particular case where capital studies to state subsidies to state-controlled firms um, could interact with the output subsidy attribute of uh, China's inter, uh, emissions trading program, which, would, which essentially means that um, uh, you might expect the uh, dynamics that Billy described for um, output-based subsidies to be particularly strong in the case of state-owned firms that are already, to some extent, output subsidized through this uh, capital channel. Now, um, there's also, I think, an important elaboration of a model like this that would look at interactions with input costs. Um, what this means is that you would expect that an emissions price to increase basically the relative price of using capital for the state-owned firms if capital and CO2 intensive energy are complements, which indeed um, uh, is the case for many of the sectors that the ETS would cover. Um, I think what this uh, exploration, uh, two questions that it raises is, um, goes back to one of the, one of the key justifications for using a market-based instrument um, in, within China for the emissions trading program, which is basically to try to reduce overcapacity in energy-intensive industries. 
question is, would a CO2 price help to do this? Well, um, it, would, uh, it would certainly subsidize abatement for those firms, but actually, um, to some extent, uh, mean that private firms are undertaking less in a dynamic sense, um, this you could poten potentially be um, uh, uh, advantageous for state firms that are becoming cleaner and have uh, over time, but at the same time, um, uh, is a question about uh, whether or not actually um, the um, if if these firms are if this CO2 price is sort of undoing the effect of an existing pre-existing capital subsidy uh, that of course um, will uh, will lead these firms to undertake less abatement. Um, so in one sense, you're 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 uh, Basically, countering one distortion or one um, uh, well, one distortion with with another, um, uh, uh, and that's I mean so there's there's an open question there. Um, the other se the second question I think that's important to consider is if you just reduce capital subsidies altogether, would you get real reductions in CO2 emissions in the absence of emissions trading or a CO2 price? And this is I think an open question um, uh, as well. So um, the second two themes that I mentioned, um, the fact that state firms are subject to social re responsibility goals um, and greater enforcement pressure through a different set of channels, uh, has a couple implications that I'm just going to um, speak about in an integrated way um, for in the interest of time. So um, state control firms are, uh, have um, very specific goals when it comes to um, sort of social responsibility. These change over time and they differ by various level of, levels of government. Um, these firms are often face tougher penalties um, and these uh, penalties and the interactions also vary over time. So there's sometimes bargaining around the time frame on which these firm specific uh, reductions must be achieved. Now, um, we, uh, the, I think the big question is if state controlled firms um, are accustomed to meeting targets within their own boundaries because they have to or because local governments need to show that their enterprises are actually undertaking um, significant effort, um, is a question of whether purchasing permits will be equivalent effort to undertaking productions within the firm boundaries. And I see Professor John nodding. I, I think this is potentially a challenging uh, question around to what extent will the emissions trading program really deliver um, uh, cost uh, savings in addition to um, its uh, emissions reductions, reduction goals. Um, let's see. Uh, the other aspect here is that governments that are responsible for implementation may lean very hard on state firms. Um, if they have limited authority over other firms of other ownership types, including foreign owned or small or private firms. In fact, there's a lot of evidence from the early development of the system that private firms and uh, potentially also foreign owned firms don't have the same direct links um, to the state. That has made it actually quite difficult to bring these firms on board, both in the basic setup of the system as well as in the operation. Um, I have a few examples that I, for time, I'm not going to go into in great length, but you can see the dynamics of firm-specific targets um, very strongly in one program called the Top 1,000 Firms Energy Saving Program, um, when it, the program was expanded from essentially 1,000 state-owned firms to include a much wider range of ownership types. Compliance rates dropped dramatically. Um, this is also true um, if we look back at the 11th five-year plan and the reduction of SO2 emissions, that occurred primarily through the state-controlled uh, electric power sector. Um, we also see this in the, uh, the the fact that many of the firms that are subject to the ETS, um, and, uh, they are also subject simultaneously to air pollution uh, con uh, controls that overlap to some extent with what they would do under the ETS. This, I think, is a less of a problem. A bigger problem, of course, is that um, what what happens if a set of subset of firms does not comply? So I think um, I'll just, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip um, uh, ahead and say, uh, what should we worry about most among all of these different um, 
concerns around state control. Um, the abatement capital subsidies, I would argue, are not uh, are not are not too discomforting for me. I think that um, while they will affect the distribution of rents, but they are not ultimately going to um, uh, completely undermine efficiency or the operation of the system. Um, there's, I think, one of the more problematic aspects is potentially unobservable non-participation by a subset of firms. So this is around falsifying data. Um, observable non-participation provides an opportunity to design and implement countermeasures, but unobservable non-participation, e.g. cheating, um, I think is uh, potentially um, something that we should speak openly about and think about what are some ways to encourage truth-telling. There's a lot of good work that's been done in this area, including um, uh, by Esther Duflo and colleagues. So I think um, the, uh, um, let's see, so I think the main point I want to arrive at out of this analysis is that it may be important to take a sector-by-sector -sector approach to launching China's emissions trading system. Um, it should be a national sector approach as opposed to a regional one. Um, but I think that there are a number of arguments for why um, the variation in state control within different sectors uh, provides an opportunity to learn as sectors launch how uh, emissions trading interacts with the underlying features of these different markets. And as we learn, those uh, uh, different features uh, can, can be assessed, for example, in the electric power sector, almost entirely state-owned um, in other sectors. It's significantly, uh, state ownership is significantly more limited. I would suggest that um, we might expect an emissions trading program to work best in sectors that have the strongest market orientation, to include sectors like cement and aluminum smelting that have a high degree of competition um, uh, and very little state ownership, um, very few price controls, um, but all firms need to participate. And so if it is truly a challenge to bring private firms into the system, then um, that will need to be addressed separately. And I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will have uh